Good morning, everyone. <laughs> nice to see you all here. Uh, so Guy uh, alluded to where we've been and what we're doing today. So today we are in our fourth and final month talking, uh, week talking about generosity. And uh, in the first week, Guy brought us a message about generosity of heart, which was really about living from the knowledge of the abundance of God, not from a scarcity or a, a sense of there's not enough, but more from an, a knowledge that there is enough and actually we can have this heart of generosity that draws us to give. And then after that we had Andy bring us uh, generosity with words, which was really around encouragement of one another and the beauty that that can draw out across one another and then also some of the pain that can happen uh, when words are used in, in opposite ways. And then last week we had Rebecca give us a wonderful message about uh, deeds or actions and she talked about the passage from James and uh, James the book of the Bible is a very practical passage and it talks about faith without deeds is dead. It's very to the point uh, but about how we can be generous in our actions and today we're talking about generosity as a lifestyle, our whole life encompassing generosity. And so we're going to go through our passage uh, bit by bit um, so you've heard it was said, love your neighbour, hate your enemy. But it goes on, now this whole passage in Matthew is related to generosity. The whole context of it is generosity. Jesus talks about how we are children of our Father in heaven and he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. We, in contrast, we love those who love us. It's a lot easier that way. <laughs> and we greet our own people. We're often quite good at that. And so he concludes by saying, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, we'll come back to this be perfect because that is quite intense. <laughs> but if we think about the generosity of God, it reminds me of the parable of the sower. And I won't go into this too much because we do have a parable series just coming up. But this is Van Gogh's painting of the sower. And the story of the sower is that there's a farmer who has a whole bunch of seed and he scatters it in four places, or he scatters it everywhere and it falls in four places. One is the path where it can't take root and the birds come and they eat it. Another is where there's shallow ground and the seed goes and it starts to grow and it looks good, but then the sun beats down on it and it withers because it doesn't have enough root to hold it there. The third is when there are weeds, the seeds get scattered amongst the weeds and the weeds tangle over it and it isn't able to grow and thrive. And the fourth is the good soil, the good deep soil, the rich soil where the seeds fall, they take root and they grow and they thrive beautifully. And one of the interesting things about this parable, we talked about this on Wednesday at our midweek service as well, is that the farmer scatters the seed everywhere. The farmer doesn't just look around, test the depth of the soil with his finger, make sure it's all good quality soil, and then go, yes, I will sow it there. That's the good soil. The farmer sows it everywhere. And I think sometimes we can be tempted in our own lives if we're sharing perhaps the good news or maybe talking about our faith, we might think, oh, I'll tell that person because they might be interested or they might even already be a Christian, so that's safe, that's good. <laughs> We don't necessarily sow it everywhere. And certainly in my own life, not that I'm a particularly a generous sower, but I aim to be, uh, in my own life, sometimes I've been very surprised by people who have responded to the gospel, who I had no idea that actually they were quite good soil. Um, and I've ended up having these really amazing conversations with people where I thought, wow, I possibly should have talked to you earlier about this, but oh well, we're doing it now. And that generosity that God has, though, where God sows the seed everywhere, even in our own lives, we may not have felt like we were good soil, but we're all here. There's something of God that's growing within us. And so there's another passage in Corinthians where Paul uh, is talking about sowing again, and we'll go through that. So remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, 
because God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. But here, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. The service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you've proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and, ev and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And as we think about this generosity as a lifestyle, it's so important to remember this generosity comes from God. God is an incredibly generous God. And when we look back through the stories of Scripture, we think about the garden and it talks of the story of the people in the garden and this incredible generosity that God has given them, these fruitful trees, this abundance, this ability to walk with their creator God in peace. And what do they do? They choose the one boundary that God gave them and they test it. Do we do that in our lives? <laughs> God has given so generously to us. And yet we still find ways to test it, to test the little boundary. And I think a beautiful part of that story is that when the people have failed, they eat from the tree they weren't meant to, and God clothes them. They stand there in their shame, which didn't exist before this, by the way. They were walking peacefully and in union with their God. They stand in their shame and God clothes them. They try to clothe themselves. They make these fig leaves. We all know how reliable fig leaf clothing is. <laughs> and God clothes them. But not only that, God destroys a little part of his creation by killing an animal to clothe them with animal skins. God's generosity to us is so deep that he destroys a portion of his creation and he clothes us to cover the shame that we have brought on ourselves often, or that others have contributed to as well, but God clothes us. That is such generosity from a God after we just did the one thing he told us not to. <laughs> and that generosity continues through the scriptures, and it culminates really in God giving of himself, literally, himself in Jesus as Jesus dies on the cross for us. But it continues on to this day. We have generosity now. <laughs> it was only about just over four years ago that I wasn't sure if I'd ever be able to carry my own children, and God gave maybe a little too generously. <laughs> uh, and God's generosity to us looks different for everyone. Everyone has their own pieces of generosity, and sometimes that generosity can be really hard to find, and I do acknowledge that. Some people's lives do not feel like they're full of abundance. But there is that underlying character of God, which is to give, which is to give generously and abundantly. And so that brings us to our next part. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, in the context of generosity, what this is saying is it's not saying aspire to be Jesus or there's no point because we're all going to fail at that. But in the context of God, whose character is generosity, we are to aspire to be perfect and to take on that characteristic just as God has it. Jesus, who shows us who God is, because Jesus is God, Jesus shows us this beauty of generosity as well. He's going around the different towns, he's sharing the gospel message, and people flock to him to be healed, to be forgiven, to be restored to their communities. And Jesus doesn't wave them away and say, no, no, I've, I've got a purpose here. I'm going to do my thing. He stays with them and he heals them. In some cases, it says he healed every one of them. Jesus' nature is to be generous. When he's presented with need, he meets it. 
it is in his nature. And so we are called to be like that. But it doesn't mean we just have to try really hard. One of the things we often think about is we think about Jesus being the same as God. Jesus is God. Jesus has all the traits of God. We are adopted children of that God as well. And so we can take on those family traits as well. We don't have to really try to bring them out from ourselves by ourselves. But we inherit those family traits as we spend time with our Father God. A little side note, there's this really cool thing in science called epigenetics. I'm not sure if anyone knows about that, but there's, uh, there's essentially nature and nurture. And you may have heard a whole bunch of debate around that, and nature is what you're born with, and nurture is what you grow up with. But there's this incredible thing called epigenetics, which is where your nurture can affect your nature, where you have these genes within you that can be turned off or on depending on the environment that you are surrounded in. And they often talk about it in relation to allergies or asthma or things like that where you might have a really strong family trait of that, but actually if you grow up in a different environment, that may not be part of your life at all. Or vice versa, if you grow up in an environment where uh, actually there's a lot of those sorts of factors around, uh, then yes, that trait will be turned on and that could be positive or negative. But actually as adopted children into God's family, we can take on these family traits. And so just as Jesus was perfect, we can live into this generosity of God, this whole lifestyle that God and Jesus take on, and we can have that ourselves. It doesn't mean we just have to try harder. It means we spend time with our Father God and with people who we know are generous people and we can adopt that lifestyle where actually our life is continually giving. I want to leave you with one final analogy. You may recognize this. This is the Carter Foundation, uh, Fountain, Carter Fountain in Oriental Bay. Or so I hear, because I never see it looking like that. It's never on when I drive past it. <laughs> this is a great frustration of mine. When we used to live in the hut, we used to pick people up from the airport and we'd drive them around Oriental Bay as the nice scenic route, you know, and I'd go by and I'd think, oh, I wonder if the fountain's on today. No, no, no fountain again. And I'm sure there's reasons for it. Someone from the 9 a.m. congregation said something to do with the wind and I don't know, sure. But in my mind, it's a fountain. When it's not on, it's nothing. It's a hunk of metal in the, I assume it's metal, <laughs> in the sea. And in our lives, I think generosity... We're called to have a lifestyle of generosity where it's like a fountain. It spurts out, it overflows, like the Corinthian passage said as well. It overflows, and then also it's replenished. But it doesn't overflow because it wants to be replenished. It overflows just because that's what it does. That's what a fountain is. It just overflows. But it also gets replenished through that so that it continues to be overflown. If we jump for a moment back to the sower passage, the giver of seeds gives abundantly, so you can keep scattering those seeds, and that giver will keep giving you seeds. With this fountain, it overflows. If it stops, it's kind of more like a bird bath. I mean, in this case, probably worse than a bird bath. I don't think it even holds any water. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> but, um, but a bird bath, the water's there. Maybe it's great for a time, but then it gets stagnant. Maybe someone comes and replenishes it. Maybe it's good for a little bit then, but then it's stagnant again. <laughs> A fountain is continually replenishing, and when it's going, it's beautiful. If we think of our lives as fountains and our generosity as a fountain, we give and we get in return in order that we may give, and it's a continuous growing. Imagine if we in this room were all fountains to one another. Imagine what could happen there. Imagine if we took that into our communities and we were generous fountains there. Imagine the Perhaps a little pool we might replenish, which might start to turn into a little wee fountain, which might then grow into its own fountain. Imagine the difference that that gospel, that good news of the generosity, the generous heart of God might make in our communities. To take the metaphor one step further, I really wanted to bring to you a chocolate fountain. I tried really hard, everyone. I asked a lot of people if they have a chocolate fountain. I have one. I tested it last night. It's not working. But the, a chocolate fountain, I think, is an even more beautiful example of a fountain. And that it is, I mean, it's chocolate. It's definitely beautiful. 
but it is a sense that people are drawn to it and you, it's beautiful, it's great. <laughs> And you receive from it, and you gather with others around it, and it's this, I think it's even more of a sense of the generosity of God. So you can imagine at morning tea that there's a chocolate fountain. <laughs> but I really encourage you to have a think in your life. What does this mean for you, this whole message about generosity? Because I think if you take it to mean, oh, I need to do more generous things, uh, sure, maybe, But actually, this is not about doing generous things. This is about being a generous person. And we gather that from the immense generosity of God to us. So let me pray. Loving God, we thank you so deeply for the generosity that you have shown to us. We thank you for the way that others have inputted into our lives and have been Jesus to us. Thank you for Jesus himself and the way that he lived his life and the way that he taught with his words so that we could understand the generous heart of you, God. May you draw us into that family trait of yours. May you rest that spirit of generosity upon us and may we be replenished in order that we could overflow to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.